In this segment, we're gonna talk about zero-shot prompting, which is gonna be a way to get large language models to do various tasks for us just by giving them natural language instructions. So this is a capability that we started to see with GPT-3 and then uh, the modern LMs like uh, GPT-4 and ChatGPT have really kind of taken off with. Uh, they have this ability to basically do some tasks based on being having been exposed to them during pre-training. So this started to be remarked on with GPT-2, but just didn't work very well yet. Uh, what the authors noticed was that if you put the token TL uh, semicolon DR at the end of you know, a paragraph and then started generating, the model would generate a summary. And this is because this is used frequently online at too long, didn't read to, to preface a summary. So this kind of indicates how training a language model can actually get you a model that's able to do other tasks. So then the question is, given that we have the ability to do these other tasks, or we've at least seen them before, can we elicit these from the model? Can we get our language model to uh, do something for us just by giving it a text specification or by giving it uh, examples like we've, we've talked about previously? Uh, so these are both very flexible paradigms that can handle classification tasks, uh, text generation, sequence to sequence tasks, and, and other things. Okay, so let me kind of show you the basic idea behind zero-shot prompting and some of the basic terminology. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use our language model to label or predict on a single unlabeled data point X. And we're gonna go come back to sentiment analysis here and suppose that X is this short movie review. Now, what we need to do is we need to take that raw data and we need to wrap it in a form that's going to be passed to the model, which we're gonna call a verbalizer. And so in this case, what that's going to do is it's gonna do two things. First, we append review to the beginning just to maybe tell the model that this is a movie review. Is this necessarily the best template? I don't know, there could be other ones. Uh, it's just kind of one way to indicate this sort of thing to the language model. And then we uh, give it a prompt before it's going to make its predictions. Out of positive, negative, or neutral, this review is blank. And then we uh, generate with GPT-3, and in this case, ideally, it generates neutral. And we can use different prompts to get different kind of sentiment judgments. So for example, we could say on a one to four star scale, the reviewer would probably give this movie blank, and maybe it would generate three stars as a continuation. So immediately you can see that there's a kind of greater flexibility than in a lot of classification tasks because we're able to specify some sort of label space and then ideally the model will respect that. However, there can be problems with this. For example, if we just generate from the model, what if we ask the model for a star rating and then it just starts generating something else? We don't necessarily have a good way of constraining it only to use the labels that we give it. We can take another approach, which is to basically constrain it that way, where we can say, all right, we're gonna specify these three labels, and then we're not gonna let it generate freeform. We're only going to compare the probabilities of the token positive given X, the token neutral given X, or the token negative given X. So we're basically asking the model, okay, within these three things, score each of them, and then we're going to return the highest scoring one. Uh, so it's, this is nice because we can sort of normalize these probabilities to get a distribution. However, I will say that it's still not very clear that the model totally knows the semantics of all of these labels, right? If you fine tuned a model on a data set of sentiment examples and you see examples of all of this, the model can learn, okay, here's how the you know, neutral is getting applied in this data set. Whereas with zero shot prompting, you're completely at the mercy of how this was sort of happened in the pre-training data. Basically, did the model see neutral being used in a way that's like how you want neutral to be used? And that may be true, but if you're asking it to do something slightly unexpected, it may the fact that it has this prior from its pre-training may actually cause problems for you. Okay, so we've talked about several of these different approaches. How much difference does kind of changing the prompt make? We're not gonna compare these two approaches specifically, but we are gonna look at different verbalizers here. This is a paper by Gila Gonan et al, where they looked at 
making a lot of prompts by manually writing some and then uh, basically paraphrasing them and kind of auto-generating a whole bunch of different ones. So on the y-axis here, we have task performance on a uh, topic classification task. So higher, higher is better. And we see that a prompt that works really well, for example, is this one, in which section of the newspaper would you expect to find this article? Seems to work, work pretty well. Now, the x-axis shows perplexity, which is perplexity of the prompt itself. So what they're doing is basically evaluating how natural is this prompt. And if you look all the way on the right, they have what's this news as one of their prompts, which you know is probably not something we would write down and expect to give good performance. But we see that it, it has much higher perplexity. The model doesn't really think it's a very likely string and it achieves lower task accuracy. So the kind of interesting thing is this general shape to this, this plot, right? Where uh, as the perplexity gets higher, as you're giving a less well-formed uh, verbalizer, the model starts to do less well. However, there's another interpretation of this, which is that actually many of the prompts are doing just fine. So one thing that this tells us is that a little bit of prompt engineering and basically getting in the realm of reasonable prompts will often get you to a pretty decent performance point, at least on this task. So uh, they evaluated this a little bit more systematically across a wide variety of tasks and looked at the average accuracy across all prompts and the average accuracy across the best 50% of prompts. And that best 50% accuracy was typically quite a bit better. However, again, the gap between the sort of median or sort of medium good prompt uh, and the best best prompt may not actually be that high. Um, so there have been a number of techniques proposed to do sorts of prompt optimization techniques, either via gradients or black box optimization, things like reinforcement learning. Uh, and we're not going to talk about this literature. The story may change, but at least at this point, many of these do not dramatically improve the results over just doing some manual engineering. Um, they may be really expensive to run, and oftentimes if you just try four or five different prompts, you'll find something that works pretty well. And another kind of asked ingredient here is that the latest models like ChatGPT are specifically trained to do better when given prompts compared to basic language models. So they're just much more accommodating of ill-posed prompts and things like that because of how they were trained. And so uh, it's a little kind of role of prompt engineering and how much that's going to specifically uh, you know, drive performance improvements uh, is a little unclear going forward. That's the end of the segment.